we broke in March, we were just getting into the service of the sacrament. But since it's been since March, I figure I'll take today and possibly next Sunday and just do a quick review of uh, the divine service that we've covered so far. And so it will be um, much faster than we've done it, obviously. But it'll also involve less uh, running back to the scriptures, but more just kind of me explaining the parts. Uh, if you want to know more of the scriptures, you maybe miss those times, you can get the videos from YouTube, I believe, starting last fall we started that. Yeah. Um, otherwise, I do have the big presentation that I've been using throughout. If you want to look at the slides for that, I can get you those as well. But today we'll just be kind of breezing through, trying to get through a good amount of the service. All right, so uh, what is the pattern of worship from blank to blank, then from blank to blank? What is it? God to man. God to man, and then from? Man to God. Man to God. This is why we use the language of divine service. The primary focus of what we gather on Sundays for uh, is for God to work on us, which is exactly the language used of the Sabbath day, is that it's the day of rest for man, but God is at work uh, in man on that day through his word. All right, we also covered the idea of sacrifice versus sacrament. That sacrificial actions in worship are those actions which are from us to God, whereas sacramental type actions are those from God to us. One of the easy ways to tell, almost always, what's sacrificial versus what's sacramental is which direction the pastor is facing. Okay. The pastor is facing, and you see his back, it is a sacrificial thing. The pastor is the hinge point. Um, sometimes he's speaking on behalf of the, the believers, the congregation. Sometimes he's speaking on behalf of God. And, and he, depending upon who he faces, that's what, telling you what's sacrificial versus sacramental. Okay. What has God promised to work through for our spiritual good? Thunder and lightning? The means of grace, right. The word and the sacraments. And you can get into a debate about what sacraments there are. Uh, baptism and the Lord's Supper are always usually agreed upon. Some people would include absolution into that as well. Some people would include ordination into that even further. Uh, but again, you can have that debate if you want. Alright, so what is the liturgy proven over the centuries to be able to do for God's people? This builds off the last question. Why do we have this liturgical worship? Why don't we just do whatever we want? If we do whatever we want, what happens to the focus on the means of grace? Yeah, it kind of goes away. The focus becomes whatever pastors come up with cool with this week. Right? And that's what those kind of congregations end up doing, is their pastor or worship teams end up spending almost all their week figuring out, oh, what is it we want to do? Um, instead of, you know, where the pastor is studying the Word of God so he can properly preach it, and so forth. Okay? Alright, so again, our service starts off. If, if you wanted to, you certainly could grab a hymnal uh, and follow right along, because uh, we're just going to run through it. Hymnals are back there, they're there, uh, they're all over the place, because uh, they're not in the pews. So feel free, if you want to grab a hymnal, um, to just follow along, page 184 is where we're starting out, obviously. As you go through that, uh, a beautiful thing they did in the Lutheran service book is they put, uh, page 184, they put those Bible verses in the column on the right uh, for each part of the, of the liturgy. Um, this was against all those accusations over all the years that you, you Lutherans in your traditional worship, uh, you know, we, we, we like biblical worship. Well, all right, now read all the Bible verses and see how biblical our worship actually is, how Bible-filled it is. So an invocation is to invoke, call upon the name of the Lord. It's a mark of Christians from the earliest times in the book of Genesis. It's noted that Christians call upon the name of the Lord their God. And so an invocation is just part and parcel primary to Christian worship. It's even primary to the, to the Christian's life. If you remember in the small catechism, when Luther explains your morning prayers, he says to start out with what? An, inv 
invocation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Which is the next thing. It's an invocation of the true God. Well, who is the one true God? The triune God. And so the invocation is the starting point of our worship, and from the very start, our worship is exclusive. It excludes. We don't worship other gods here. Okay? If you have a different god, this worship isn't for you. Okay? And of course, it always brings us back to our baptism. God's grace shown to us, lest we think that we're there for... Uh, whatever reasons we think we've gotten there for, because we were so good about getting up or whatever, um, we are reminded right away of our baptism. That is our calling to the, to the household of God uh, by God's grace, uh, where he made us his children and so forth. So there you have the invocations, taken right from Matthew 28, um, other, way, other places as well. Congregation says in response to the invocation, so be it. Amen. Yes, yes, it shall be so. If you remember your catechism, this is the word of faith from the congregation. It is a, a word that takes ownership of what has just happened. What has just been prayed. What has just been said. You answer with an amen. It means yes, I agree with this. Yes, it shall be so. And then you move into beloved of the Lord. Let us draw near with a true heart. Confess our sins to God our Father and so forth. Right? Okay. We approach the Father how? In that exhortation, we, of course, already are invoking based upon, uh, in, uh, we're already calling upon God through the Son. Okay? There is no other way to approach the Father than through the Son. And that's good news for us, because there's no other way in which we are righteous and holy and can stand in, the, in front of the Father and bring our petitions to the Father, but by the righteousness and holiness of the Son. So it always goes through Jesus. Okay. And then you have the response in the verse goes, Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. That is a confirmation of creation. Yes, we are old fogies in that we believe God actually created everything. We actually believe he created it in the six days like he said. And we, we believe that he created it a relatively short time ago. Not millions, not billions. And yet we confirm that right away at the beginning of our worship as well. And there's the, the uh, and you forgave, I better get this up so I can bubble more. I got the pastor parts down pretty well. The congregational parts are a little harder. Alright? I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, from Psalm 32, which was our psalm today. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Right? So we go from creation in the first little versicle. Now we're talking about redemption. Where's sanctification? Because you have usually the three. Creation, redemption, sanctification. Right? The three articles of the creed. Where's the, the, the life of holiness of a Christian in these versicles? We've confessed creation. We've confessed redemption. Well, how about the very fact of confessing? That's where sanctification is. The fact that you're confessing God's word. Proclaiming it in public amongst other people. This is a sanctified thing. It's what God's people do. Alright? So then we move into the confession. Uh, you have that pause, the reflection. Hopefully you've taken more time than the 8 to 14 seconds that the pastors take to have silence. Hopefully you've taken more time than that to prepare to make confession. Uh, but Lutherans keep the confession around. Why? For the sake of the absolution. Everything in the Lutheran Church is geared around the forgiveness of sins. And so we keep confession, whether it be public confession or whether it be private confession, uh, not to hear uh, you say you're sinners and not to hear your specific uh, dirt, uh, but we, we keep it so that way you can hear the words of forgiveness. That's always the purpose. And that, that, that would be there to, to, so that you could hear the forgiveness of your sins. Uh, the public confession has history in the Lutheran Church all the way back to the Reformation. Uh, Johannes Bugenhagen, who was Luther's pastor, 
Um, he, he, when he wrote rites of worship uh, for his countries would invite him in to, to organize their church, and he would usually come up with a hymn book. And one of the things he usually included it was a rite of public confession for the whole congregation to confess their sins together, and the pastor absolved them. Okay. It's individual, right? The pastor starts us out, All, Almighty God, Merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner. You don't get to confess for somebody else. Even though I think we're far better at confessing other people's sins than we are our own. Um, but but the, the confession is really meant to be our sins being confessed, mine. Okay. The confession reflects the fact that before God we confess all sins, even those we are not aware of. Sin against you, sin against God. Right? That these sins might be done to a neighbor, but ultimately they are always done to God. Because ultimately they, they offend and affect our neighbor, but ultimately they offend and break God's law. Besides that, of course, as we've talked about before, if you break any of the other commandments, you've automatically broken the first, which is the commandment about idolatry. Okay? We do confess that there is such a thing as temporal and eternal punishment for sins. The eternal stuff we get usually, the temporal stuff is sometimes a little bit of a shock to us. What do you mean there's temporal punishment? That God would actually punish us here and now in this life for our sins. That's what we confess. Okay? I am heartily sorry for them. And sincerely repent of them. You have this sorrow and repentance. Uh, this is a, a work of God, the Holy Spirit, in you to create this sorrow over your sins. Indeed, it's the work of the Spirit to even work repentance. That is, not only the sorrow for sins, but it also includes the faith in Jesus to trust in Him for the forgiveness of those sins. That's the full picture of repentance. It includes all of that. And then again, that confession goes what? Your boundless mercy. Okay? Just like we started out addressing the Almighty God, Merciful Father. He's full of mercy, out of your boundless mercy. And then where do we run to? And for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ. We do not, we do not plead for forgiveness based upon our intentions. We do not plead for forgiveness based upon other people's worst sins. Nothing like that. We plead for forgiveness based on God's mercy, and we run immediately to the work of Jesus. Immediately to the forgiveness that He earned through His holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death. Okay? And then we ask to be gracious and merciful to me, and we repeat again, a poor, miserable sinner. Okay? We're always running back to what Jesus has done in worship. If you have a question during this, you feel free to ask it. Um, I just, we're just trying to move on through. So, so. absolution, yeah. Yeah, temporal punishments. Okay. So God's word has set up that there is punishment sometimes through government. Um, so you commit a crime, which is a sin, right, usually, and even what the government has to say about things. Um, but then the government has this right from God to punish uh, breaking the law. And so that can be one of the temporal punishments. Other temporal punishments, um, a husband who commits adultery on his wife, the temporal punishment might be, oh no, here comes divorce. Okay? Um, other just kind of natural punishments can happen. Diseases from different sexual immorality and so forth can be part of that temporal punishment. Um, just uh, there's a whole slug of things, and you, if you read the Old Testament, you get a sense of this: that, that God really does use this life to chastise and to punish sometimes. Because the ultimate goal for God isn't to just sit there and grind you down into nothing. It's of course to to wear out your self righteousness, to wear out your pride that caused that sin and so forth, to to, to grind it out of you, so that you would confess your sins 
and be humbled again. Okay? And so sometimes he does that temporal. Um, in the same respect, he's a, he has a lot of mercy on us. Because there's a lot of things that we should receive temporal punishment for that we don't seemingly get temporal punishment for. Bill? Could we expand that? Yes. They and suffered punishment by going into captivity. Correct. That's absolutely true. I mean, the Old, the Old Testament points that as a picture that, that God even punishes nations for their this sins. Is a temporary thing because later on they came back to their land. Right. They had that promise from God, if you remember. They had, they had the promise that it was going to only be 70 years and they'd be brought back. Um, other nations don't have such promises. Um, and, and so they, they should. Uh, Heed his warning. And, and that goes especially even for our own nation. Um, and I think that some of what we've seen happen, I'm not going to draw an exact correlation, but our, sin, our, our nation has no shortage of sins. And, Could we and, expand that to 2020? Right. Yes. Yeah, well, it, it, I'm not going to tie it to a specific set of sins, but I will say that it is certainly a wake-up call to people that this life is not as stable as people thought. And, and, and that's been the historic understanding of life. I mean, that's why you get the, even the pagans reflect upon the instability of life and how fleeting and so forth it is. Our age just seems to think that life is just so stable and everything's going along just as it has been. And, and I'm going to get my 75 to 95 years on this earth and, and everything else. And, and God, in having all this happen, has kind of stripped that. Well, we've got some things going on, the same sex marriages, and other things that are uh, very, very much against uh, yeah. people. And there was some statistics that came out that said that today we got about Probably less than that, less than ten. Well, if you figure in, I mean, all of the, I mean, this this is the funny, right? They they ask you know the question, they ask usually in a poll, do you consider yourself to be a Christian? And and you know that number's shrinking dramatically, but even seventy some percent will be like, yeah. But then you look at who's actually in church, and it's ten, maybe less percent. Um, we're not horribly far behind in Europe in that respect. Um, as far as just the general apostasy, falling away from the faith. And so certainly that's sin. Um, we have national sins. Uh, you know, we've, we've murdered the unborn for decades and upon decades. Um, we certainly, in, in many cases, are a merciless nation. Um, we, we, we conduct uh, attacks and, and assaults and offensive wars. Um, all kinds of things like that, which are not God pleasing. Um, yeah, there's just there's no shortage of, of what our nation has kind of welcomed in and even standardized. Like, I mean, this is just who we are as Americans. And um, well, yesterday, yeah. we, had, we had the funeral for Mrs. White. Yeah. And afterwards, there was a community house, and I went out there. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's, I mean, there's, I'm glad I'm not a ruler, because they have a really hard set of decisions to try to make, because you have to balance out one thing against the other. And it's, that's why you pray for wisdom for your rulers, because the decrees they make affect a whole lot of lives. And, and that's, I mean, 
God's blessing upon a nation can be a wise ruler, but God can also punish a nation by giving them the ruler they deserve. So um, you set the country down, <laughs> you save lives because of the um, virus going on, but you lose them. Yeah, it's, it's all a matter of what wisdom and so way you can tell. lose more people that way than if you don't shut the country down. It's a matter of wisdom. Pray for wisdom for your leaders. Yeah. Uh, and specifically in our form of government, that means uh, Governor Gordon. Because that, that's a governor's call to make on those things. Um, so, yeah. So we keep this idea of the absolute, we keep confession because of the absolution. The word of forgiveness. Okay, and the word of forgiveness comes spoken by the pastor, but it's not the pastor's forgiveness. This is from God. I reference John 20 there. That's where uh, Jesus breathed on his disciples and said to them, of course, uh, whoever sins you forgive, they are forgiven. Whoever you retain, they are retained. Um, this is one of the questions that happens in the individual confession, right? The pastor will actually ask the penitent, um, do you believe that my forgiveness is God's forgiveness? Okay. Um, and, and the answer, of course, in the, in the, is yes, I do. And that's based upon God's word. That Jesus has uh, authorized pastors to speak the word of forgiveness, but in, in that same passage, he commands that word of forgiveness to be spoken. Okay, so that the penitent hear the word of forgiveness as a command of pastors. You see, uh, you guys live under the gospel all the time, and pastors do in so much as they are Christians, certainly. But pastors also have laws that they have to follow, commands from God. One of them is to absolve sins, uh, to forgive sins. Okay. Uh, we always have that reference of, in uh, for virtue of my office as a called and ordained, referencing the uh, call that comes uh, from God immediately through the congregation for a man to serve in a place and a certain people. Congregation. Ordained, as we're going to celebrate next Sunday for Pastor Bakey's 10th, ordained is that first time the pastor is set aside publicly. He has, he's received a call from a congregation to serve and to preach and teach and baptize and minister the sacrament, and now ordination happens. Ordination is the first time the pastor is set aside. He's marked, he's taking uh, sometimes they call it holy orders in the old Roman Catholic Church, and sometimes Lutherans use that language. He takes orders, and what that means is he makes vows to God about how he'll conduct his ministry and so forth. But that ordination is the public recognition of that call. And there's an exchanging of vows and so forth. There's also some blessing and hearing of the passage of the scriptures. And there's also uh, the prayers for the man who's being ordained, and then there's also these other pastors who show up usually at ordination, and at that ordination they lay hands on him, which is an old apostolic custom you can read about in the book of Acts. And that laying on of hands from the other pastors is, is also a mark of the ministry, that he's being set apart for this task. Okay? And so that's when he says, called and ordained servant of God, right? or servant of the word. That's what he's referencing. And then, of course, in the stead and by the command, so you're in the place of Christ, and you're doing it by the command of Christ, the pastor is, and then you, you forgive. And then, of course, the forgiveness, uh, I, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. You invoke, again, the triune God's name, uh, which draws you back to baptism, but also draws you back to the exclusive nature of the forgiveness of sins. Uh, it's for those who believe in the triune God so forth, and it draws you back to baptism. Uh, yeah? On the laying on of hands, we only do that at the ordination, not the installation. Of Correct. The Some Missouri City congregations get confused about that. Worse than that, some Missouri City district presidents get confused about that. But there's, there's only one ordination, and that's, just, that's the first time, and that's when the man has his hands laid on him. Yeah. Dave? If I tell someone that God forgives them, is that valid? Yes, that's a proclamation of the gospel, and so it has the power of the word of God behind it. So absolutely. Okay? Um, I mean, we do that all the time, especially even when people sin against us, right? 
Because when somebody sins against me and they say, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, Josh, I, I, I sinned against you, I can say, well, I, I forgive you. Or God forgives you. You know, because that's the word. That, that, that's, the word has this power. The, the ministers are meant to publicly uh, execute, publicly do this for the sake of the congregation. But that doesn't take away the fact that the word of God has its own power in it. The gospel itself has the forgiveness of sins in it as it's spoken. Um, so it, it doesn't, you know, it, it's not meant to be that. Okay? Alright, so then we move on to the introit or the psalm, depending upon where we are in the church here. We're still in Trinity season, so we're using the psalm for the week. Uh, when we get to Advent, we usually use uh, the introit and so forth. Introit is a fancy word for enter. There used to be a lot of movement in services, and so introit, uh, there was some movement that went on to a different part of the sanctuary. Now it's just basically uh, the pastor goes from the font where he forgave sins up to the altar where he will now pray the collect and so forth. Okay. Psalms, used throughout the Old Testament, of course, there's a big connection there. Um, yeah. That the Old Testament worship and then the, new, the early church worship was just filled with uh, recitation and singing of the Psalms. And I say singing uh, because that's actually, I mean, the whole point of the Psalms is to be sung. Uh, which is why we've switched over to actually singing the Psalm instead of just speaking it now. That's what happens when your pastors get a chance to read a book or two, find things out they've been doing wrong. All those, uh, all those introits or psalms end with a doxology. We spent a lot of weeks on this uh, because it's significant. Uh, this glory be to the Father. Okay? That this is uh, a, a wonderful, glorious thing. Um, and it's a new thing. We went through this. That throughout the Old Testament, you don't see God's people saying this kind of stuff. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, or anything like that. It isn't until Jesus' birth, when the angels bring this heavenly song to earth. And from that point forward, the doxology, the glory be to God, is a part of Christian worship. And it is focused upon. Because they notice the significance that that God has come down amongst us in the flesh, in Jesus. And so this is so significant. The church brings this tune in to, to everything. So you have this glory be to God the Father and so forth. And, and you have it at the end of the introit. And then we'll have it, of course, with the glory in excelsis. Glory be to God on high and so forth. That God is present. Um, Christians can glorify in this fact since Christ. Meaning, since Christ has done what he has done, the church can sing what it sings. Okay? Um, here's a, a good quote I decided to keep in. By, by performing that doxology, we tell the world that in and through the risen Lord Jesus, we have access to heaven here on earth. We acknowledge, laud, and proclaim the gracious presence of the triune God with us. And as we perform that doxology in the very presence of the living God, we who have been called by the gospel to share in the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, 2 Thessalonians, are glorified as we glorify Him. In amazement, we forget ourselves. We do the only thing that we can do in God's presence and say all that we can ultimately say about God. That it has a great significance. Okay. Um, we'll get to the next one in a second. And you move on to the Kyrie, right after the introit, with the glory at the end. Um, this is, Lord have mercy upon us, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. It's a, a scriptural prayer, as old as the creation, or the fall. Before the fall, you didn't need mercy. But after the fall, we can live by mercy. And so we cry out in awareness for who is present and how our own personal righteousness doesn't measure up, but also with confidence in the righteousness of faith, the righteousness of Christ which is reckoned to us when we believe in Him. Because of that righteousness we can cry out. Right? And we cry out for mercy. 
we know who we are. But we also know who God is. So we know he answers this, this plea for mercy. What does he answer it with? With mercy. That's how he does. Because of that, then you can enter into the angel's song. This is the greater glory, the glory in excelsis. Right? Um, one of the things you'll see in the different, different uh, divine service settings in Lutheran service book is other ones will have what they call as a hymn of praise. Um, the hymn of praise doesn't begin to touch what the glory in excelsis is. Okay? There's just a big difference between the two. A hymn of praise is sure, it's just like a hymn. But the glory in excelsis is something far, far different. It's far greater because this is, of course, the song that the angels bring from heaven to earth. It's a heavenly thing. It is, a, it is an entirely Christian thing. The Old Testament believers didn't sing this stuff. The Christians did because of Christ. Okay? And the glory in excelsis, as we sing it in the liturgy, it ties the birth of Christ to his crucifixion. To his ascension, it includes adoration of the Father, the Son, and just a little bit of the Spirit. So it's more than just a hymn of praise. It's, it's the glory. It's its own thing. Okay. okay, so we finish singing the Gloria. Pastor turns around and he says, The Lord be with you. The congregation responds. And with your spirit. In this, the Lord be with you. The, the pastor extends his hands out towards you in blessing. He's, he's bestowing something to you. That's the symbolism there. But he's also praying for the congregation when he says, The Lord be with you. It's a prayer as well that, that the, the Lord indeed would be with his people. Okay, and then the congregation's response is, And with your spirit. Which is again, also a blessing, but also a prayer for their pastor. Okay? It's not just a handshake, it's not just a greeting. It's so much more than that. Uh, but we, we've kind of lost that because uh, since the 60s, uh, the common change has been the Lord be with you and also with you. We've kind of lost that. That formality of it, of the blessing and the prayer, but changing those words to kind of, just kind of like, How, how's it going? Ah, pretty good, how about you? You know, that kind of interaction, rather than, and with your spirit. Um, this is often called the little ordination, an acknowledgement of a pastor's service in the, amongst the people. Okay, which is better with your spirit or, and also with you? Well, in worship, I would definitely say and with your spirit. It's far better. Notice, however, like when we're greeting the congregation before the service, people still respond with, and also with you. And that's just fine, especially during that time when we're not actually in the worship service yet. This bestowal of blessing and prayer, the Lord be with you and with your spirit and so forth, is found all over in Scripture. It is part of the preparation to pray, this, the collect of the day, and then the amen of the congregation. It's also preparation uh, to hear God's word. Um, that here the Lord, uh, the Lord be with you and with your spirit is also setting up that pastor so that he can, not long after that, go over to the lectern and read God's word to God's people. Proclaim God's word to God's people, and so forth. Collect, okay. collected prayer, the prayer of the whole congregation, um, a little bit different than the prayer of the church, which we'll talk about next week, but the prayer of the congregation for a given Sunday, it's usually very much keyed into the gospel lesson for the week, uh, especially during the festival half of the year, that is from Advent through the Easter season into Pentecost. Trinity sees a little bit more flexible on the matching of those. Usually starts out with uh, address or invocation, Almighty God, something like that. Uh, basis for the petition uh, is usually some level of praise of some attribute or work of God. Uh, since you always are happy to show mercy, something like that. 
Petition is actually, you know, what you're actually asking for. Be merciful to us, uh, for we are sinful and need your mercy every day. And you have three and four. Okay? Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. There's your doxology, or what they sometimes call the full termination. And every collect is broken up into those pieces. Uh, so why? Why do we have this prayer here? It's the collected prayer of the whole congregation and the whole church. We're, we're, never, we're never just our own, okay? It, it's the danger that happens, especially in American churches, is where you think that your church is the church. Um, and you forget that we're part of something much larger. It's, it's collected and concentrated thought of the epistle and the gospel lessons especially. We'll get into that in just a second. Um, this teaches us to pray. You see, as, as you hear more and more church collects, you start kind of, you don't even, you don't remember, oh yeah, part one, two, three. You don't remember this stuff. But you start seeing the pattern of prayer. You address God, you name something about God, something that you know to be certain and sure, and that's the basis of why you can ask. God says he's merciful, so I can ask for God's mercy. And then you petition and so forth, and then of course you, you end up with the doxology, through Jesus Christ, because of course that's how your prayer is heard, is, is by faith in Jesus. He takes your prayers to heaven itself. But the collects teach us to pray and how to pray. Uh, the collects have been largely unchanged since 800 or so. They're quite old. And you move into the lessons for the day. Okay, and in this section we covered the fact that we use a lectionary. Uh, that's just a fancy word for a set of lessons from Holy Scripture given for each Sunday of the church here, as well as feasts and festivals and other things and so forth. Uh, it it's now includes an Old Testament epistle and a gospel lesson. Uh, it includes usually a psalm for the day. Uh, it includes the introit for the day as part of the lectionary and so forth as well. Okay. Uh, but it's a set pattern of lessons. Uh, it's a beautiful, wonderful thing because it saves you from the tyranny of me. Okay. That I, I, I may have favorite things I want to teach and preach on, favorite sections of scripture and so forth. But guess what? The lectionary drives me out of what I want. And it sets me into this path of, okay, this is what's set up for the congregation this week. Which is good. We use the one-year lectionary because it's the, the kind of historic one here, but the main reason is for teaching's sake. You get the same lessons every year, and they repeat. Because learning is about repetition, and deep learning is about constant repetition. The change in pedagogy and, and so forth that came in the 60s that resulted in the three-year lectionary. Well, I think we've had a seen enough of it nowadays. We've had uh, 60 years of this three-year lectionary stuff, and it's been long enough now that we can definitely say that it has, has not helped people know more of the Bible. And in fact, it's caused probably less doctrinal knowledge because the one-year lectionary is designed around... You have these set passages for each Sunday, and this is kind of the doctrine that is taught. And you follow the whole year, and you have all the doctrine taught in a year. Okay? And you have these passages which teach that doctrine. <coughs> so you heard Pastor Bakey introduce today about law and gospel. That's kind of the doctrine taught as he taught today. Lessons are teaching the word by read, being read aloud. So who is given to teach publicly in the church? Under worship? Pastors. We went through a number of passages of scripture which teach that. Um, also, it's again something that's kind of fallen into some confusion, especially since the 1960s. My big thing about that is, what else has the pastor got to do during that time? Every once in a while, I hear the story of the pastor who would take the epistle lesson or the Old Testament lesson and, 
and use it as a time to go in the back room and have a cigarette. And I'm like, mm, no, sorry. So, but if you, if you view it, and this is why I often use the word lesson rather than reading, because I think lesson makes it very clear what's happening. There's teaching going on. It's not just open public reading. There's teaching. The Word of God's going out, and that teaches people. Yeah? In some churches where they have a lay person read the Old Testament. Yeah. That's a confusion that comes in in the 60s. See, in the 60s, the, the Roman Catholic Church goes into a conference or a council. It's called Vatican II. And from that council comes out this kind of new liturgical thought as the liturgy is the work of the people. Okay. So it's this kind of populist thought and, and what it does, and, and Lutherans grabbed onto it. Um, so it's funny the things from the Roman Catholic Church we grab onto. It's strange. Um, but they grabbed onto it and, and thought that this is a great thing, and so you get the, the lay readers and so forth. Um, but again, it, it, you look at the scriptures, who's reading in, the, in, in, in public? It's, it's the, the teachers, the the ones who've been set up to teach. It's, um, it's, it's the act of reading scripture out loud in a church service is proclamation. It, it's like preaching. And so it's given to certain people to do that. And, and of course that's why we have the office of ministry. So it's a confusion. It, it's brought on by... Uh, they thought that by having lay people read the scriptures, they would, um, they would get more people involved in church. But it's a betrayal. Because it's a betrayal of what you're actually supposed to be in church to do. So this is Luther, when he gets to the small catechism, the table of duties in the, in the church, the, the, in the estate of the church, he gives the duties of what uh, preachers owe their hearers. And what hearers owe their preachers. And so you have this, this beautiful distinction in the church of preachers and hearers. Now what does it do to a person who is appointed to be a hearer and make them now be a preacher because they're proclaiming God's word. It's a disservice to where God has put them. And the place where God puts you is the most blessed place, whether it's preacher or hearer. And so it's a, it's a betrayal, it's a confusion. It, it just comes from all the, the mistaken notions that, that have just kind of invaded and infested the church over the last 60, 75 years. Just different denominations have been in a lot of Missouri Synod churches. Wow, you wonder if they're the Missouri Synod church. Well, the Missouri Synod used to pride itself on a lot of its unified belief and unified practice. That has all changed that the Missouri Synod now prides itself on its diversity. And uh, I think that's what you're seeing. And that's why you have uh, such a diversity of voices now in the Missouri Synod as well. Um, God's Word does not praise diversity. Not in that respect, anyway. And certainly at the end of all things, you have people of all tribes, languages, peoples, and so forth. Because you have to get that in Revelation 7. Um, but uh, the church is to have one, one voice, one mind, one judgment. Um, unity is supposed to be what the church's goal is. So, it's... Yeah. How does this story that uh, Jesus was in the synagogue and he was handed the uh, scripture he read from Isaiah, how, was he a dignitary or something like that? Well, what was he? Are you talking about the boy Jesus? Which one are you talking about? When uh, he said, this day, this is... Oh, this is fulfilled in my reading. When he's reading from Isaiah? Yeah. He's, he's, that's, he's a public teacher. And so he's publicly teaching. It's difficult to use Jesus as an example in these things because, of course, Jesus holds the office of Christ, <laughs> Messiah. Um, and so there's things that he does that are given to him to do specifically. Um, I think it's Acts 15 that talks about every week when Moses is proclaimed from, the, from your lessons from the scriptures. And that's talking about this proclamation that happens. It's preaching. But yet, so Jesus would be, because he's a rabbi, I mean, you, you see that all over the place, and people refer to him as rabbi. 
Well, that, that's not just some kind of friendly, like, hey, yeah, you, you know the Bible well. It's, no, he's, he's actually a public teacher appointed for that task. He also, of course, is Christ, which means that he's got a lot of different things as well. So. All right, so what time is it? It's time. All right, we will get into the Old Testament lesson next week. Um, any last-minute questions today? Yeah. How, uh, maybe why do you always use the same, uh, well, like divine service setting in three? Yeah. Of varying in the do you remember what I said about learning? Yes. How do we learn? Repetition. By repetition. You'll see some other reasons why, and, and I probably hinted at a couple of them today. Uh, one was the Divine Service Setting 3 has the greater Gloria. Um, it has the Gloria in Excelsis instead of a hymn of praise. And that's just a by far better arrangement. Um, and it has the With Your Spirit. It retained that. Um, we, the order, when you get towards uh, the creed and preaching and the offertory offering and then the prayer of the church and so forth is better than the other orders because that's where it gets all mon monkeyed up in the other settings. But more so because three is the common service. It's called the common service on purpose because this was the service that kind of comes out of the Reformation, so to speak. That this order is the one that's kind of observed by the most churches. And so it's the most kind of universal of it. Uh, so much so that, I mean, if you go to the Book of Common Prayer for the Anglicans, they follow this, this well, maybe not anymore because they've gone crazy, but... They used to follow this exact same kind of order. And so that's why. It has this uh, beauty within it of these components that the other ones don't have. It has the theology in it that the other ones don't have. Because the other ones all come out of this 1960s stuff. A lot of them do anyway, I should say. Um, and so we kind of hold out of this common service for the repetition's sake, so you can learn deeply. Um, so that, you know, you, you some days I can see and look out at the congregation, and many have stopped even picking up their hymnals for the liturgy. They, they're knowing it now, which is good. Um, especially as we move ahead in our world and see things totter and fall apart. It, it's good to have things in our minds. Remember. So, um, Pastor Bakey's working on something for the congregation on that very question. Because uh, the elders have asked us to put together something for that. And, um, Pastor Bakey's actually a, a better scholar of the liturgy than I am. So, so he's working on something with that. Bill. I want to react to Pastor Bakey's sermon today. Yes. About your neighbor. Yeah. And I draw the conclusion that everybody's your neighbor. Correct. Now, we have a problem going on with the virus and so on. People are in need. And recently, we had some Warner family that had a need. And I responded positively. you run into anyone that does, let me know. Because I, I, that's, that's, we've been, we've been looking out. Uh, in fact, Joe and Merle have both been available since this all started to help with any of those earthly things especially. Uh, pastors, of course, are trying to focus on our, our pastoral care of members. And we've had a number of members who have had pastoral care come up through this situation, whether it's um, you know, concerns, worries, but also uh, the, the stress and the strain of it all. It's, it's hard on... Uh, marriages, it's hard on the working life, it's its hard on all these things. So that's the stuff the passion is focused on. We do have some wonderful elders who are helping try to take care of any earthly uh, needs as well. So yeah, if you know anyone, bring it up. This is what the congregation is here for. This is what Christian brothers and sisters do, is we take care of one another. So, absolutely. Let's pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the gift of your word. We give you thanks that you come to us through that word in divine service each week. We give you thanks that our divine service is based upon that word. Help us to worship rightly with hearts focused on you by faith in your son Jesus, ready to receive your good gifts, but also to sing your praises and thanks afterwards as well. Through Jesus Christ we pray these things. Amen.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.